All right, we have a packed schedule here today. We're going to head, go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining. I'm sure we're going to have more join as we get started. But welcome to the great debate, DTC versus marketplaces. Here at Kahoot, we're thrilled to be joined by Big Commerce, Tenuity, and Channel Advisor for a friendly debate between a bunch of experts in the e-commerce space about where to sell and how to sell differently on different platforms. Uh, we're, we're honored to have a bunch of the very best minds in e-commerce with us today. And so let me introduce you to your panelists. First, I'll get the boring stuff out of the way. I'm Luke Criffield, Senior Manager of Growth and Strategic Operations at Kahoot, and I'm joined by my colleague, Aldi Juono, on the Q&A panel. So we will be watching very carefully all of your questions coming in, all of the chat. Please do not hesitate to shoot in your questions. We're going to mo move through the presentation piece relatively quickly. So uh, we'll be collecting all those questions for the end so that we can really dive deep into what's on your mind. So please don't hesitate. And to introduce you to our co-hosts, first up, we have Manish Chowdhury, founder and CEO of Kahoot. Kahoot is the world's first peer-to-peer -peer fulfillment network. In our peer-to-peer -peer fulfillment network, we've empowered merchants to fulfill on behalf of other merchants with our intelligent software. The benefit of this network is that it powers affordable, fast and free shipping at low cost by design. Manish has over two decades of experience in the e-commerce world, and he started his first company actually 22 years ago in his dorm room at Bridgeport, Connecticut. He has 10 patents, and he's been featured in leading publications like the New York Times and Forbes. Sharon is the VP of Revenue Growth at Big Commerce. She's an experienced sales and business development leader who's expert in omni-channel e-commerce and digital marketing. She creates deep relationships with platform and ecosystem partners to keep her finger on the pulse of the industry and uses that insight to empower her growth teams. And I'll also add, she'll be sharing that insight with us here today. We're really excited to have her. Katie is a senior client strategy manager at Channel Advisor. She collaborates with her clients across marketplaces to maximize net profit, revenue growth, and brand exposure. She focuses on brands that earn over $50 million per year in DTC revenue, and she helps them explore expansion opportunities to drive strategic growth. We're really excited to have her speaking to the marketplace side of the equation here today, and she has so much expertise across the whole, the whole ecosystem. Uh, we can't wait to hear what she has to share. And finally, last but not least, Roman is Director of Growth Media at Tenuity. His focus is on helping over 300 clients accelerate growth with, uh, with really sharp paid media, media approaches. He has over 10 years of experience as a marketer, and that experience helps him appreciate the big picture because he's kind of done it all. And he situates his work for his clients in a really balanced approach and strategy. So without further ado, let's give you a little sense of what you're going to hear today. So today we're going to take a bit of a whirlwind tour. Uh, and again, that's why I'm emphasizing, we want to get your questions, you know, keep them fast and furious because our presenters are going to lay down the foundations in a fairly fast manner here today. Manish is gonna set the stage by speaking to the current state of e-commerce competition. Uh, you know, there's a ton of growth across all ecosystems, but he'll, he'll show you why the growth isn't quite equal. Then he'll turn it over to Katie, who will speak to, well, why should you sell in marketplaces? What are the biggest advantages to sellers? You know, why do people love them? And Sharon will present her side of the story on why should you sell on the DTC sites? What are the unique advantages of DTC sites for sellers? And you know, why do customers love buying there? Then it's really not an either or. And so we're gonna dive deep into how you can win on both. And Roman will really jump in here and then in the next section on channel specific advertising strategies to help give you some insight on how you need to approach different channels differently. Finally, Manish will wrap it up by speaking to the shipping and delivery and really that operation side of the equation, how it's different across channels and how it doesn't have to necessarily be different across channels. And then again, 
we'll get to that Q and A. So first up, let's I'll pass it over to Kate or to Manish, excuse me, to speak to the current state of the e-commerce world. Hey, Manish, uh, I can't hear you right now, and I think the folks, folks in the audience can't either. Um, I heard you in our in our sound check. Um, maybe you need to, uh, do you have a, a mute issue with your phone? I'm going to give, uh, thanks for standing, staying with us, guys. Uh, I do know these slides as well as a member of Kahoot who worked on them with Manish. Um, so I'll get started on them. And then Manish, if you can hear me, please cut in whenever, uh, whenever you're ready. Sorry for the technical difficulties, folks. So as I teased in, the, in, the, uh, in that agenda slide a little bit, uh, everyone's growing, right? I mean, we've all heard this story, especially from COVID, e-commerce is booming but the growth isn't exactly equal. You know, Amazon has long dominated the scene and the top three marketplaces together, which already in 2020 accounted for almost 400 million or billion, excuse me, grew 21%. So they grew from a big base and then actually added even more to their, to their, uh, to their haul in 2021. On the other side, there's been a tremendous explosion in you know, Shopify stores, big commerce stores, uh, WooCommerce, Magento. There's so many different options for folks. And, uh, and, and so more and more brands are going online and doing it in really cool ways. And we see that in that 15% growth, but they're not pulling down quite as much GMV as the marketplaces. So this begs the question of, well, why are marketplaces, why do they have so much of the, of the space? And why are they continuing their fast growth trajectory? Uh, so Kahoot actually commissioned an original study uh, at late last year to jump into this. And what we did was we compared the prices of uh, products from really popular brands with top, uh, with top, uh, top, top D2C site on the DTC site against the offer for identical products on the top marketplaces. Take this example of Olaplex, who has a leading shampoo brand. On their DTC site, and we actually verified this the other day, you can get their shampoo for $37.02 when you add the price of the product, shipping, and taxes all together. Look at the prices on Walmart and Amazon. You can get, a, I mean, if you go to Walmart, you get over $10 off because they're not charging for shipping, and Walmart actually charges less for the item as well. This was sold by a reseller. On Amazon, it's sold by Olaplex. It you know, ships from and sold by Amazon, means Olaplex is doing it and behind the scenes. So they have the same list price, but again, there's no cost for shipping. And so you get a way better deal on the marketplaces. Katie will get into this a bit, but that's I'm incredibly. Back. Can you hear me? Oh, hey, Manish. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, take it away. I, I wasn't doing I, it as well as you could. No, no. I apologize, everyone. Thank you. Uh, well, this is uh, part of the Kahoot study we conducted uh, last year. Essentially, what we did uh, was we looked at the state of uh, shipping and delivery and product item price for top 50 Shopify and top 50. Um, websites on um, on the DTC websites and compared their popular product across marketplaces and how they fared. And this is a glimpse of uh, uh, what the study was all about. So we looked at an item. Here's an example from a very popular brand called Olaplex. Uh, so we looked at uh, what is the final total uh, item price for this particular item on their direct-to-consumer website. And as you can see, uh, it's about $37. And then we 
also search for the same identical item on Amazon and Walmart, but we also wanted to study how long will it take for the item to be delivered and what was the total end consumer experience uh, to, to really learn why our marketplace is growing faster and if it is indeed, uh, you know, if it's a myth or if it's a reality, what, you know, we all know about what attracts co consumers to marketplaces, but uh, this was a deep dive study that we did. And so what we learned here is this uh, product uh, that uh, if you buy directly from the uh, DTC website, it's going to cost you uh, $37 and change. But what's worse here is that uh, shipping is uh, paid for and there is no certainty. You have no idea when this item will arrive. And then if you were to hop over to Walmart, you know, it is, uh, this product is uh, being sold by a third party seller. But as a consumer, you know, uh, we are all e-commerce operators here on this call, but we are also consumers. Um, we don't frankly care uh, as long as the product is authentic, uh, who do we buy from because marketplaces provide us the guarantee of uh, uh, no questions asked returns and refunds and so on. And you can get this on Walmart for $26 and change. And uh, the certainty for delivery is, is a free delivery, but it's a seven day delivery. And then when you hop over to Amazon, uh, you can get it for $29.78. And if you're a prime member, it's a three day delivery. Not sure why it's three day, but uh, um, typically it'll be two day. So you can see from this example that, uh, and this was not an isolated example, and I'll share with you the results of the study on the next slide, um, that what is the state of DTC versus marketplaces? And on the left-hand side, we looked at the price uh, of uh, the identical item on the brand or brand website and what it would cost to purchase the same identical item on a marketplace. So on the orange slide, uh, the bars that you see is Amazon. Um, we found that the same item was available on Amazon at a cheaper price 59% of the time. And on the right-hand side, the same identical item was available on the Walmart marketplace 58% of the time. So as you can see, the behavior is quite consistent across Amazon and Walmart. And almost 60% of the time you can purchase the item cheaper on a marketplace. And granted that some of these items may be sold by third party sellers, but if you place yourself in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the shoes of the consumer, you know, consumer really does not care. And what was even more striking was that when the price was worse, there was a, there was a large gap that uh, the products were significantly cheaper on the marketplace, almost 28% in case of Amazon, and 31% uh, in case of uh, Walmart. And why I wanted to highlight this, that this is not an isolated example that we shared with you of Olaplex, uh, and there's an opportunity for brands to, to level the playing field. Next slide, please. Thanks, Manish. Uh, we, yeah. we actually did the, the Olaplex side, uh, and so we're gonna jump on to, to Katie now. So, I mean, we've established, you know, the, you know, a little bit of an edge that many marketplaces have these days. So let's hear from Katie on to why should you as an e-commerce merchant sell on marketplaces? I mean, you might think it's obvious, but uh, it's, it's important to understand the fundamentals here. So Katie, please take it away. Hey, everybody. Um, again, like Luke had mentioned, I'm Katie Burr. I'm one of the senior client strategy managers here at Channel Advisor. I've been with the company for about five years, but you're not really here to learn about me, you're here to learn about my marketplaces. So before we jump into this first slide, while the topic here today is quote unquote, the great debate, like Luke mentioned, it's not one or the other. All of the panelists here are aligned that it's crucial to have a holistic omni-channel approach. You can have one or the other, but if you're looking to really maximize your revenue potential, you need to have a marketplace and a D2C.com strategy. So as we go through our content, my hope is that you'll learn new things, validate things you already know, and be able to leave with knowledge and insight to help your company strategize its online approach. Now, with that being said, as we look at this first slide, you'll see Amazon with 353 plus million products and then Walmart with their 43 plus million products. And if you'll notice, what this all means is that there's digital departments, expanded categories, and ease of use. And 
I wanted to preface this with more than 70% of product searches are now happening on Amazon. And for the searches that are happening offsite, say on Google, Amazon has been not so quietly dominating Google's search page. And what that really all means is that Amazon is continuing to slowly chip away at Google's share of total digital ad revenue in the US. And they're going to surpass that in by 20% at the end of 2022. So when I mentioned these digital departments, expanded categories, ease of use, what this all means is that the customer can efficiently find and buy your products in one locale. And Amazon knows that and they want to funnel as much traffic as possible that they can to their site to these buyers. So if we move on to the next slide, there is a marketplace for every consumer and pretty much every seller. Now, back in the 90s, when Amazon was founded in 1994, uh, they only sold books, but we all know that today Amazon is a behemoth, um, but look what's come with it, with all the growth on the marketplaces over time. You have new niche marketplaces that are gonna allow you to reach your desired consumer base or type of buyer. So in, in today's world, there are thousands, and I wouldn't say thousands and thousands, but there are thousands of marketplaces for all kinds of sellers and buyers alone. You even have grocers like Kroger who opened up their own marketplace back in 21, and they're seeing success. And when you think about Kroger, you might think just about your typical groceries like, you know, broccoli, frozen foods, I don't even know, like milk, stuff like that. But you have to think of the other lateral categories, baby products, home and garden, cleaning, health, beauty, wellness, you can expand it to much more. Lateral categories like that also can make sense for a marketplace like Kroger. And then you also have these expanded marketplaces in today's world like Poshmark. They're dipping their toes into the marketplace space. And for those who might not know what Poshmark is, it really formally started as a resale space for apparel items. But now they're looking to brands to help curate new items for that marketplace. And it would also be a great space for any items that have been returned back to a D to C and then resold there. So what I'm trying to say is with marketplaces, there are many ways you can merchandise your, your catalog strategy. You have some sites like eBay and Walmart that are great to sell through outlet or final sale items. And then you have Etsy, which makes sense for customized and small batched items. So with the next slide, you have fast and free shipping. So Amazon, you know, they were the pioneer of the two-day shipping badge or the prime badge with two-day shipping. And now they have same-day delivery. Then came eBay, I think in 2017 or early 2018 with their own guaranteed delivery badge. And then Walmart came next with their two-day badge and I think like 2019. But like I had mentioned, Amazon was the pioneer of two-day delivery and took it step, one step further with one day. And you started to see all these other marketplaces adopt practically that same delivery strategy because as the buyers that we are in the US in 2022, it's obvious, but we have this urge for instant gratification. Amazon knows this. They take advantage of this on our behalf. I'm not mad about it. Um, but you'll notice that the kind bar on the left-hand side from their .com site does have an extended delivery time frame. So if you're a brand or a reseller that's looking to meet consumers where they are shopping, they are shopping at the Amazons, the Walmarts, places like that who are going head to head to be competitive in the same space to make those delivery time frames to provide that same handling time. And that's where you need to be in order to gain and capture more control of your consumers and where they're shopping. But with that being said, many dot coms are seeking new ways to improve their delivery timeframes in order to be more competitive with the marketplaces. So it is only a matter of technology adoption um, and just time for the D2C sites to go head to head with marketplaces. And I know just in a couple of minutes, Sharon's going to have great updates on the advancements that have already been made in this space. And before I pass it off to Sharon, the last thing I wanted to talk through were feedback and seller metrics. You'll notice across all three of these options, there are feedback ratings. Obviously, buyers are determining their what they purchase based on feedback and price. 
delivery, things like that. But feedback is an important aspect. Not only does good feedback increase your conversion rate, but it just offers you a space to understand how your product can improve from a buyer's perspective. And if you're only selling on a dot-com site and say you have an item that is has great reviews, great feedback, you could just mirror that on Amazon itself um, and capitalize on knowing that you're likely going to get good reviews there, increase your brand exposure and awareness, and just have an overall better experience for your consumer across all channels. And then lastly, marketplaces, especially key players like Amazon, Walmart, eBay, are holding sellers accountable um, and to provide best in class customer service and shipping out orders based on service level agreements on what's advertised on these listings that you can see ahead. So consumers have built a huge amount of trust with the marketplaces knowing of that guarantee. Thank you, Katie. I, I mean, it's it's a story that many of us, as you mentioned, know as consumers now. I, I go to Amazon all the time, right? But it's, they give us what they want. And especially in Amazon's case, they have created and consistently raised the bar and makes it harder for everyone to catch up. It's certainly a lot of strength. But that's not to say that there's not a ton going for DTC sites as well. So we're really glad to have Sharon here to provide the perspective. And I mean, I've done a dry run, uh, two dry runs of this with them. And, uh, you know, she's got a great case. So, so Sharon, please take it away. Yeah, you bet. Thank, thanks so much for having us. So um, I think what we really need to think about here is um, what do what does a shopper want when they're shopping online? Because that's actually what we're, what we're talking about here, right? Is what what is the omni-channel shopper experience that somebody who is selling something online want to be able to create? And so... Um, so, so as an example, what do we all want? We're all shoppers, right? In, in this post-COVID era where all of us have shopped on many different channels um, that, that we had to for the past two years, we all want the same things. Number one, is this a product that I want? That requires the, the relevant catalog data for you to make that decision. Number two, is it available near me? Number three, how much will it cost? And number four, when will I get it? These are questions that have to be answered on literally any channel in order to drive conversion. And so when we talk about the benefit of marketplaces versus direct to consumer, I think what we need to contemplate is, are you delivering a good experience on your direct to consumer site? Because if you don't have price parity across channels, that's not a benefit of a marketplace. That, that is something that comes with marketplaces. And in order to do it well on direct to consumer, you have to make efforts to do so. Um, it, it is easier, the benefit on a marketplace is that in some cases, it is easier to have a guaranteed two-day delivery if you are sending products to Amazon for, for with fulfilled by Amazon guarantee, um, as an example. But there are experiences that you cannot deliver on marketplaces because you are not the merchant of record on Amazon. And so in instances where a web store is a certain and a must, um, examples of this are, if you want to be able to deliver a differentiated user experience, if you have complex products that require assembly, if you have high consideration purchase, meaning you need to be somebody needs to be able to double click into the product details or how something is made or uh, price compare things or do counterfeit risks or if there is after sale you know after sales support offerings, if you um, want to be able to lean into search engine optimization and marketing capabilities in order to drive. Um, a loyal customer who comes back to you over and over that will eventually drive a, a higher lifetime value. Well, I'm seeing something else on the screen here. Um, and then similarly, you need to be able to create longer term relationships. I think there's something over the screen that I'm seeing. Um, and so generally speaking, benefits of a direct to consumer website are number one, you control the distribution channel. Number two, you own the customer data. So you're creating a community that you actually own, meaning you have the first party PII. You are the person who understands who your shoppers are. You get, and you have the right to market to them again in order to increase the lifetime value of the customer that you're creating there. Um, you, you own that customer data and you get to use it to iterate on driving additional value for your business. Um, you get to control the customer experience. So, and this, this becomes really important when somebody has an experience they want to deliver that doesn't fit within the side of the box of, you know, a plus content as an example, um, or enhanced brand content, um, personalized shopping experiences are really critical. Um, and so no, feel free to go to the next slide. Um, I think one of the things that we really see is that in maximizing your profitability, um, it used to be really hard to launch a direct to consumer experience. And that's not the case anymore. 
Um, and so certainly one of the, the benefits is when you own your own direct to consumer site and, and the conversion thereon, certainly you pay for your, you know, whatever the, the processing fees are from a payments perspective, but you are not paying an eight to 20% referral fee to Amazon plus potentially um, any of the other kinds of fees that might be associated with the convenience, convenience of their offerings. Or uh, Walmart similarly has um, six to 15% referral fees. And as we see other marketplace categories, this is kind of the going rate. And we're, we're starting to see in the social commerce ecosystem um, as conversion happens on those channels, that, that that's kind of a model that's going to continue now, be it at different rates for social commerce. But again, the instance here is there's, there's kind of a spectrum of do you own your customer or not? And then how much does it cost for you to sell on there or not? Because certainly there's a big opportunity around uh, attracting new eyeballs and, and trying to convert them to being a loyal long-term customer. Uh, um, but one of the ways that you have to con contemplate maximizing profitability is to, um, once you have a relationship and have created that relationship, figuring out how to remove the middleman so that when people know they want to buy from you, they can come direct to you uh, so that you maintain that profitability. Next slide, please. Um, some of the other things to, to contemplate beyond kind of profit margin and is also the ability to sell um, additional products that are higher risk. So not all channels allow all products to be sold. Um, and so I think you have to, you have to kind of contemplate um, what products and what categories are you selling in. Katie did a good job of articulating to us some of the categories that work really well on marketplaces. There are others uh, that are not as well suited towards marketplaces. Maybe they're better suited for social commerce, or maybe they're better suited for a direct experience with those use cases that I um, articulated before. So it it very much depends. And as I think we all, we all shared, um, you need to have a channel strategy that contemplates what products are you merchandising on marketplaces in order to be able to capture, uh, you know, the significant volume of, of potential net new customers, um, while at the same time having a strategy that allows you to extract profitability out of channels that you own and continue to have a relationship with the community that you're building. Very well said, Sharon, and thank you. Uh, and uh, now, now we're going to get into what I think is uh, is the, the really the most interesting part of the webinar. Is, is that we're going to speak a bit to the other side. So first, I'm going to uh, I'm going to make Katie speak to. Okay, tell me why should brands come to marketplaces? And then next, Sharon's going to have an opportunity to say just the opposite. Uh, but first, Katie, um, you know, sum it up for us. Well, I, I I feel like this slide summarizes it perfectly. Of why should brands sell in the marketplaces? you're gonna reach consumers where they are shopping. Um, we are all probably buying on Amazon. I buy on Amazon a little too often. I'm a little ashamed of how often I shop there, but regardless, it's important to meet your consumers where they are. And then finding new customer segments. Having your own .com site, you own that customer. Whereas if you're on a marketplace, you don't own that customer, but you are tapping into this new market to reach out to consumers that you might have not had prior. And lastly, defend your niche. And really what that means is defend your brand because there are competitors and there are resellers that are gonna take advantage of your absence on the marketplaces. So it's important for brands to maintain their image across all marketplaces because if their products are getting in hands of not just any normal reseller, but resellers that are not meeting SLA's service level metrics, it's going to only hinder the brand because at the end of the day, the consumer remembers the product, not so much the seller. Thanks, Katie. I know it's hard to sum up and Sharon, you had so many points, but you know, do the same, take a minute, sum it up for us. Why should marketplace sellers build that brand and that DGC presence? Yeah, and a good example of this is what every what, when I talk to any merchant, every single thing I've heard after talking to thousands over the past 15 years is that every single one of them wants to grow. So when you contemplate growing, you need to think about three things, which is number one, what channels are you on now? Number two, what channels can you expand to? And number three, how can you own your customer to continue to sell to them over the course of the lifetime of that customer? And so the reason that marketplace shell sellers should contemplate building a direct-to-consumer presence if they don't already have one is because of that longer-term relationship that you can build with the person who has already been interested in products you've sold them, uh, particularly if you're a manufacturer. So if you've gone through the work to to create a product that people buy and are interested in, whether it's other things that you need to be able to offer like warranties or delivery or other services that you can't currently offer within the constraints 
experience of a marketplace. Um, this allows you to build loyalty programs or long-term uh, offerings, things like subscription. So um, when, when marketplace sellers are contemplating their growth, and if they've done well on marketplaces, um, it is now very straightforward with the integrations that big commerce has invested in with partners like Amazon around Amazon multi-channel fulfillment or otherwise, um, in partnerships with with third party logistics providers like Kahoot to be able to identify an offer on a direct to consumer an experience that is competitive with the experience that a shopper can can get on a marketplace. So the answer is you can have both and you should have both because you need to optimize those channels for different things. Direct to consumer is about optimizing your re existing relationship with the community you build and own in order to be able to continue to grow your lifetime value. Thank you. And, and what a great segue into Roman here from Tenuity speaking to, well, as you mentioned, you know, these are very different ecosystems, right? These are very different channels. Roman's going to take us through some of the some of the key principles to keep in mind of how you approach them differently to grow on them, because they really do take a different approach. So Roman, uh, please. Thanks for that introduction, Luke. And uh, real quick, before I get into these slides, one of the things that uh, we do here is in our company and as a division culturally is we give people props when they go above and beyond and really step up. So I wanna give you props uh, for filling in on those first couple of slides. I know that's not easy and thank you for doing that. Um, so getting into here where what we see for a successful multi-channel execution, um, you've already heard Katie and Sharon both talk about it, where the DDC side, you wanna create that experience, the marketplaces side, you can reach new customers. So on the DDC, what we want to do there, we want to look at the focus is we're acquiring customers. But just because somebody's going to your D2C site doesn't automatically mean that you own that customer, you own that full experience. You need to be intentional about it. And the way that you're intentional about that is you're making sure that you're collecting their CRM info so that you can communicate with them. You want to be able to focus on establishing a community, creating engagement, establishing your brand voice. That's really what you want to be able to focus on on the D2C side so that people aren't just going uh, D2C and then not having the full experience of what your brand is and what you stand for. Uh, on the marketplaces side, it can almost be seen as uh, what traditional brick and motors used to be a distribution type of network there where you don't actually have those customers, so to speak. It could be a way to introduce your product to a new customer base like Amazon, like the Instacarts, like the Walmarts of the world. There are people that like to go to shop at those places. It's just less friction overall for the experience for them to go buy from these places they're familiar with, but they can get introduced to your product, to your brand. And if they really like it, and maybe you have something unique that you don't offer on marketplaces that you offer D2C, they'll end up going back to your site and become your overall customer there. Um, and some of the things that you heard uh, mentioned too was about defending um, your, your niche or your brand. Uh, so you wanna make sure that your competitors aren't just able to, um, to really target whatever brand presence that you've been able to, to build up and to win there and essentially conquesting what you've built up in terms of uh, your brand awareness and reach on there, so on. The SERPs, whether it's Google, Microsoft, so outside of marketplaces, you're able to still own and defend those and have people go back to your DTC site. Okay, so we've heard a lot about how to do it right. What about the high level on what to avoid? Sure, so this isn't necessarily what people are doing wrong or examples of what people are doing wrong, but here's what I see um, of where it could be a pitfall is, uh, so we saw the Olaplex and the Kind Bar examples of how price could vary and oftentimes you see it lower on marketplaces and it could be tough to compete on shipping as well. So some of the common mistakes are not having price parity, not having unique catalogs, not having product exclusives or bundles on your DTC site. So trying to be one for one in terms of the product that you're offering uh, on both channels there. Uh, another thing is having inconsistent brand voice or not creating some sort of a community or engagement through social channels through your CRM targeting, through your email blasts. Once you're getting that person to go to your D2C site, once they're in your funnel as a customer, once they are a valid customer of your brand, you wanna make sure that you're keeping them engaged. Um, so I also, that screenshot there, I also wanted to show an example of a calendar here. So the month of November, there's a bunch of different holidays like the Dia de los Muertos, Singles Day, Veterans Day, Thanksgiving. That's a good way where you can create some sort of fun engagement to be able to communicate and establish your brand voice with your clientele. Um, but also you got big shopping holidays there, like the Cyber Five that we call them. So Thanksgiving through um, through Cyber Monday, essentially making sure that you're warming up people of potential sales coming up. You're hitting them throughout the entire time of that sale. And then even after. 
So not just making it so that you, you're communicating with your customer base when they're in the purchase funnel, but also making sure that they're getting communications in terms of your brand, what you stand for, and really being able to get that, that brand voice. Thanks, Ramon. And now I know we're going to get a little bit more into the nitty gritty from you for a few minutes here on channel specific advertising strategies. So we'll keep it with you and start out with some of some of the ways folks should think about tailoring their approach to pushing traffic to and capturing it on their DTC site. Sure. So on the DTC site, there's not going to be a silver bullet or a one size fits all for every type of brand, every type of business, but you can look at it in different ways. So you might be a digitally native DTC brand where you don't have that brand presence, you don't have that awareness. So you're gonna be starting by focusing your budget on top funnel type of initiatives. So going upstream, whether it's non-branded search, social channels, um, some of the more emerging channels like TikTok, uh, video, OTT, being able to get your name out there so that people know that your, your brand name, what it is that you're about, what it is that you're selling. On the flip side, we might have uh, some clients that we work with here, um, the Rip Curls Pranas of the world, or you might have seen a recent announcement from Nike where they already have a big brand presence. They're already uh, wholesale and people already know the brand and there might be a lot of search demand already for their specific brand. So that's where you wanna focus your budgets on almost filling the bottom of the funnel. So your branded searches, shopping channels, anything that's feed-based because you already know that people are gonna be looking for your brand. And instead of finding one of the marketplaces to buy from, uh, you wanna be able to start to push your D2C presence up first and foremost. Um, and then lastly here is anytime you have an existing customer base, you don't wanna neglect them. So whether you are digitally native D2C or you already have a large brand presence, you wanna make sure that you're always running retargeting campaigns for people who have bought from you before so that they're aware of new products. Um, if maybe you have a product where every two months somebody needs to resupply on that product. So you're making sure to hit some triggers of when they would be purchasing again. Uh, but also just having people to be able to know of uh, other potential upsell products that you can include with them. You bought, let's say, um, a product that is an electric device and now there's an accessory with it that can be more compatible. You wanna make sure that you're you're still targeting those customers to be able to get them to purchase from your D2C side again. And so here looking at the example where I was saying with price parity and then having exclusives on your D2C site, uh, what you might see some really strong multi-channel strategies happening here are you use a marketplace to be able to have your hero skew. People can see that, they learn your brand that way, they like the product, they try the product. This product's great. They might go back to a marketplace and buy it again, or now they might go directly to your site to see what other unique products or exclusives, bundles, things like that that you carry. So that's a good way to be able to make it so that it's not just price that you're competing on, but it's also the catalog of what you have to offer. Um, on the DDC side as well, having things like members only deals to go with the loyalty program that you heard Sharon talking about. Um, you wanna create that engagement of people that really wanna go and almost speak for your brand and be advocates of your brand. Um, and then lastly, so I said, you want to be able to acquire the customers on D2C and you need to be intentional about that. There are other things that you can do outside of just capturing an email when somebody's making a purchase um, and they're getting their order done. You can do things like uh, pop-ups or even make it fun and gamify it with things like shopping sprees, sweepstakes, gift card takeaways. The other benefit there is if you give them something where they're going to be able to buy from your direct site, you know they're going to spend money there. You're probably going to make them a customer or they're going to already increase the value of their purchase to go over the amount that you get them. So those are good ways to be intentional where it's not just asking for an email, but you're also offering something in exchange. All right, and wrap it up for us, Roman. How do you connect the marketplace and DTC strategies together? Sure, so uh, we want to reduce the friction if somebody wants to buy our product we would prefer they go D to C, but we know that people are gonna shop in different places. So here's an example of somebody like One Brands who is able to run ads that go both to marketplace channels and they go to their D to C site. That brand voice and those promotions are maintaining consistent so that people aren't seeing a different uh, brand voice or the way that the product is communicated from a marketplace versus a D to C site. Um, somebody wants to do more research on the brand, you leverage your D2C site and SERPs to be able to both have traffic that goes to your D2C site to explain the product and the brand a little bit more, or like the example there, if you can see the products in the middle image, um, you're leveraging the budget that your marketplaces have 
Instacart, Targets, Walmarts of the world, they're going to pay to be able to drive traffic to your SKUs on those marketplaces and generate sales that way. Um, and then lastly, like I was saying, you want to be able to build that community. Um, so this example of one brand, somebody might click on the ad, go buy it from Amazon, or they'll be interested in buying it from Amazon, but they want to do more research, learn what the brand's about. And then when they go to the site, you can see here that they're getting a pop-up to be able to sign for the latest offers, the latest flavors, all that different stuff. Thank you so much, Roman. And we're getting there. We have a lot of great questions coming in, so we're really excited to get to them. I'm going to give a little time check to you, Manish. I'm sorry to do this, but I know you've got a few slides and a few really interesting points to hit on here for shipping and delivery. So take us home in just a few minutes. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, it's uh, suffice to say that half your shopping experience now is the shipping experience, both as a consumer and how to win sales on any channel. And uh, if you if you wonder what does Amazon like fulfillment look like, you know essentially it's, essentially it's comprised of four parts: smart inventory placement, meaning placing inventory at strategic locations closer to your customer so that you can ship using affordable ground shipping, and it's easier said than done because getting it wrong can be very expensive. Second, you need to enable the fast shipping badge. It's not sufficient just to have the logistics infrastructure, but it's even more important to market that as we see on marketplaces, the date certain shipping, the shipping guarantee, the SLA, and it should be prominently displayed on your DTC site. Marketplaces do it for you on your homepage, category page, product details, shopping cart, all the way through checkout so that you are reiterating that guarantee so customer does not have any opportunity to leave that site and go purchase elsewhere. Number three, after you receive the order, you need to route the order to the right fulfillment location so that you are, you are maximizing your cost or rather reducing your cost. By fulfilling the order from the uh, location that has the inventory and can get to the customer within the promised SLA, you will save money and it also delight customers. It doesn't end there. You do need to monitor the performance end to end. And as Katie shared, rating and feedback. And uh, this is an opportunity for DTC sites to follow that delivery experience, shipping experience all the way. Um, not only once you've shipped the order and provided the tracking, and, tracking information, you need to ensure that the product got there on time and the customer was satisfied. Because the, uh, the, the goal here is not to ship simply ship the order on time, but ensure that the customer is happy. Now, we had an example where the customer was shipping uh, through Amazon, uh, they sell cookies and they had no idea that the cookies were arriving crumb, uh, in crumbs. And so when they called the customer and say, hey, we love the uh, fast delivery, but next time we would like the cookies instead of the crumb. And that's something that is hard to decipher because most customers will not give you the opportunity, they'll simply move elsewhere. So keep, make sure that you're tracking the performance end to end to, to deliver an Amazon-like experience. Next slide, please. So uh, you have the opportunity to do this. It is uh, uh, no longer something that uh, is only the feat of very large multi-billion dollar companies. There has been rapid innovation on the fulfillment front that is leveling the playing field. So if you wish to offer Amazon-like, Prime-like shipping experience, you have a couple of ways you can do it. You know, of course, you have the marketplace-powered fulfillment like Amazon FBA, um, and Walmart has uh, Walmart fulfillment services and Shopify has their own. Uh, the challenge that we've seen is highly restrictive. You know, Q4, you have uh, uh, surcharges. You cannot send as much inventory as you would like. They don't handle certain kinds of products and they will penalize you uh, through uh, higher charges if you wish to fulfill non-channel specific orders through that fulfillment. So in case of Amazon, multi-channel fulfillment is more expensive than fulfillment of orders that originate on Amazon. And number two, uh, you can certainly cobble together multiple 3PLs or have your own facilities uh, strategically located throughout the continental US if you're targeting the US. Uh, but you will, it's, it's very complicated because most 3PLs are 
smaller mom and pop operators, which are generally uh, the better choice for SMB uh, e-commerce sellers. But each of those three PLs have their own pricing, they have their own service levels, and then you need technology to do the order routing and dealing with exceptions. Let's say you send an order at the last minute to a 3PL and turns out that they don't have inventory anymore. So you, you, you have to deal with those exceptions in a very timely fashion and it becomes very hard to coordinate across multiple organizations given the pressures that sellers are under. And a new option that is more uh, prevalent now and becoming increasingly more popular is fulfillment networks such as Kahoot. And Kahoot is not the only one. There are a couple other options. These networks are channel agnostic. That means they fulfill the orders for every channel, DTC website, as well as marketplaces. And they offer the same affordable and inclusive nationwide fulfillment. And in case of Kahoot, we work alongside your operation. So if you have a warehouse in Southern California, you, know, you, can, you can ship orders in that region and Kahoot can help fulfill orders in other parts that you don't have coverage. And uh, most of uh, these uh, networks have superior technology. They bring in orders from all these different channels and they also adhere to the SLAs that have been promised. So there's an opportunity to level the playing field and I wanna uh, turn this back over to Luke for some Q&A. Thank you, Manish, and thank you, everyone. We've got a bunch of great questions. So what I'm gonna to do to make sure we get them to them, I'm gonna launch a poll for you guys. So please feel free to answer the poll. While you're answering it, it's just on if you'd like to learn more on any of these topics. I'm gonna to jump right into questions. And panelists, to make sure that we can get to a bunch of these, I am gonna call people out. I'm gonna ask you to try to answer, you know, give the 30 second answer, try to be succinct. I know it's not easy because these are some tough questions. First, I'm gonna go over to Katie. So uh, Atish says, yes, 74% of shoppers begin on Amazon. The problem is that the, you know, if you're going after a really, really competitive market and you know, so many markets on Amazon and marketplaces are competitive at this point, what do you suggest to folks when they're going after a really competitive niche to try to stand out? Oh, I, I actually read that question as how how do you become more competitive um, in the D2C space? But let me, sorry, let me read this um, a better Atish. So 70%, yeah, correct. Problem is that the market and the niche are super competitive, then it will be very hard to compete in reviews, keywords, PPC, right? But if it is super competitive, I think D2C and social makes sense along with influencer for super competitive markets. I think less competitive niche than Amazon marketplace makes sense. What do you suggest in super competitive? I guess, Atish, I, I feel like I actually have a follow-up question because I'm not entirely sure if you mean like being super competitive in the Amazon space or being competitive on Google, but um, if you're speaking directly to be super competitive on Amazon, you know, they're going to look more towards uh, fulfillment and pricing. Those are going to be huge pieces in order to maintain your strategy and your search rank on Amazon search page. So having, you know, a clear price parity strategy of having, like Sharon mentioned, items priced across the same or very, very close to the same points is going to be key in any selling strategy, along with having um, items sh shipped in the fastest manner, whether you're using Amazon's FBA service, or, you know, if you're even using things like a drop shipper or a deliver, which is another um, uh, fulfillment service as well. But certainly, Please follow up if you have a second part to that question, because I'm not entirely sure yeah. I understand exactly what that where where the question is going. And and we'll have we'll have Sharon take the DTC side of it too. So Sharon, j uh, jump in. Yeah, I you're exactly right. If it is super competitive on a marketplace, a DTC plus social strategy exactly makes sense, which is develop your channels, especially if you are a brand that can develop some sort of community associated with that niche, right? So if you're if there is tons of, of um, I think I think what you are asking, if I read this correctly, is in in categories that are super competitive on marketplaces, how do you win? And the answer is you have to develop a different strategy that in, that potentially can incorporate influencers and social commerce channels. And if you are good at 
um, the product data that it requires to list on marketplaces, you are going to win faster on the new social commerce channels because those social commerce channels, they used to be ads channels. And what they don't have is all the data Amazon has right now. And so what they need is merchants who understand, ooh, if I give you this data, uh, meta or Instagram checkout or others, if you will surface me higher in your search and merchandising algorithms, because they are investing really heavily in their commerce kind of discovery experience engines. And so whether you're working with Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or other social commerce channels, an opportunity for you to dig in with influencers in that space around specifically with this kind of competitive market where you might not be able to break through as easily on marketplaces, that is exactly the, um, a very, very useful strategy. So I completely validate what you're talking about um, because that kind of follows on with what Mary was, was asking, which is that in many cases, you can kind of view marketplaces as, as a distribution network in order for you to get those eyeballs, but then you have to figure out how to funnel them to the owned experience where you can sell to them long-term. Uh, so Atish, your, your strategy is totally on. We see that all the time. Thank you both. I'm going to try to combine two great questions for Roman right now. So, so Justin sent us one in chat and Nate had one in the Q&A. So what Justin said is he said he felt that marketplaces work more as the awareness component. And I think this tied into what Roman was saying. They determine their, their best sellers on marketplaces and then on DTC, they focus where they're trying to really maximize the profits of what they've learned really resonates. Um, Justin asked, do you see businesses moving in this direction, you know, kind of product discovery on marketplaces, then try to push those customers to DTC, which is absolutely what we're seeing. And then Nate asked, essentially, what are the best strategies for doing that? Okay, you're grabbing the customers on marketplaces, you're getting a purchase or two, you're learning what products work. Well, how do you then move that traffic over to your DTC site? Um, Roman, why don't you take that first? Yeah, sure. So let me go with the uh, first part of the, the question, which was related to seeing marketplaces and using it more as a brand awareness play. Um, I think historically it hadn't necessarily been seen that way. It had been seen as just a place to be able to generate and get sales from that existing customer base. But you see marketplaces like Amazon, for example, over the years, they've opened up advertising on there and even opened up things like DSP advertising on there. So you can start to build awareness and generate that sort of demand within that marketplace. But it also transpires where it can overlap. And now people start to know your brand and they look for you off of marketplace. So that's that's a good way to kind of look at it that I don't think historically had really been looked at, on, you know, except for like the last um, more so a couple of years. But the second part of the question there which was related to kind of like uh, in terms of which products to put on D to C versus marketplaces. Can you give me the, can you read me back that second part real quick with the main? Uh, sure. Questions? Sorry. I threw a ton at you right there. Um, how, what other strategies do you suggest sellers leverage to attempt to move customers and traffic from marketplaces to DTC sites? Gotcha. Yeah. So unfortunately for most marketplaces, you can't actually, like I said, acquire the CRM list or the customer emails there. So it's difficult to track that customer one-to-one -one and try to get them to move over. But things that you can do is when you are running advertising on other, some of those other channels, you can see what they're searching for. If you're running, you know, ads on Amazon, you can get a sense of what those customers are looking for. Um, you can get a sense of what products that they're, that they're buying and then try to tie that back to your actual CRM list. And is there any kind of uh, a mix or common products that people are buying on both of your marketplaces that they're buying on the DTC site? So that you can be able to almost create those cohorts of customers who buy multiple or similar types of products and then expand that reach there. Um, also, if you're doing things like DSP on, them, on the Amazon side, you're not going to get email lists of the actual customer names, but you can start to see things that people are in market for or that they're, that they're willing to buy within a marketplace itself and then transpire that when you're doing, whether it's OTT, um, whether you're doing Google Display, whether you're doing Facebook, try to find those audiences on other channels that people are, are into based off what you're seeing from DSP. Thank you, Roman. Appreciate it. All right. We're going to keep on going. I know we only have a few minutes left going to throw one back over to Katie. Uh, Katie, one of our attendees would like to know about any newer or really unique marketplaces um, that, that you just find really interesting these days and would like to share. And not to put you on the spot, but you get bonus points here if it's relevant to a beverage company. 
Oh, well, you know, to my point, Kroger, that I would talk about earlier, you know, they they started or they created their marketplace footprint back in 2021, but they have seen so much success actually in the marketplace space. Um, they've actually kind of created, I would call it a bit of a wait list because they have seen such great results as far as like revenue and GMV go. Um, and especially so if you're in the beverage space, I don't know if it's like a, a like a fizzy beverage, non-alcoholic, alcoholic beverage, that would be a great marketplace for you to look into um, and see what potential it could have for you. Cool. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go over to Manish now. We're going to build on Mary's question that Sharon uh, referenced a little bit. She thinks of the marketplaces as her distribution network. Does the presence and growth of these marketplaces, combined with the shrinkage of brick and mortar shopping, make wholesale accounts and distributors obsolete? That's a very interesting question. I mean, um, you know, there are authorized resellers. They are the new. Uh, these resellers are operating on Amazon on your behalf if you wish to authorize them. Uh, they may be considered as uh, wholesale accounts now. So uh, you can double dip. So let's say if you don't want to go direct uh, on Amazon yourself, you can you can go via your distribution channel. In this case authorized resellers. So I think, uh, you know, we're just in a phase of uh, um, some retail shift. Uh, you know, the brick and mortar presence grew quite considerably in the 90s and early 2000. And now we see a resurgence of digital channels. So, you know, it's all going to level out. I don't think it's going to be one channel or the other. Uh, and I do want to add one more point to the previous question. How do you uh, take traffic from marketplaces and bring them to your own website because um, one of our clients, Kahoot clients, uh, Cali's books, uh, you know, they sell children's books with, uh, elect uh, with batteries in them. And uh, they've been very, very thoughtful on how to do it because the batteries run out, they have a limited lifespan. So they drive those customers, the market, they acquire the customer or uh, get the sale from Amazon and Walmart. And then those customers can come back to Cali's website and order those batteries and that's how they connect the dots and get the CRM info. So you need to be very, very thoughtful about packaging and distribution when you're thinking about marketplaces and building your DTC presence. Thanks, Manish. All right, we've got one minute left. I'm gonna go one more back over to Roman. Uh, Roman from an anonymous attendee like to, says, their DTC and Amazon ads are competing on Google. What can they do to avoid overlap? A really good question, something that we uh, get from some of our clients. So it depends on what types of keywords you want to focus on. And also it depends on if you are running those ads yourself to Amazon. So there's different ways it can happen. If somebody's doing a search and Amazon's just running their regular ads, um, they're sending it to either one of your ASINs or to a search results page. Or another way that you can do it is um, you target those keywords yourself in a separate ad account. And you can use something like Amazon attribution to measure the impact there um, so that you control what that experience is like, the page that people are landing on there um, so that you are making sure they're going to the main product that you wanna be able to serve and, and show on there. Um, does that kind of answer the question? I, I feel like there was another piece that I didn't cover. Yeah, I wonder, uh, I think maybe the second piece was about uh, avoiding overlap. You know, sometimes uh, yeah. as you mentioned in your slides, the marketplaces will advertise your listings. Is, is there any way to avoid your own ads not clashing with those marketplace ads? Yeah, so it, it depends on if you're focusing on some of your most bottom funnel uh, brand keywords, for example. One way that you can do that is by trying to essentially push off the Amazon, SERP, Amazon out of the SERP, um, whether it's on the shopping side, making sure that you have multiple products that are targeting those searches so that you push it down in your DTC site is being prominent, or you've seen it in some cases, and we typically don't recommend this, where some clients might look at it and they say, okay, Amazon's giving me enough coverage for these type of searches on Google, so therefore I don't want to pay or try to serve people to be able to go back to my D2C site. But then again, there you risk losing out, of being able to get somebody to go to your site, learn about your brand, and then essentially win their, their email address uh, and then acquire the customer in, in that way. Thank you, Roman. Um, so we are a bit over time. So we're going to be respectful of our, of our panelists and everyone in the audience. And we are going to wrap up the webinar. 
but we'd just like to say a big thank you to Katie, Roban, and Sharon for joining us today. A big thank you to all of you in the audience who came, who asked great questions. I know we didn't get to all of them, uh, but please do follow up with us. Um, we'll be following up with folks that ask for more information, and we'd love, we'd be really happy to keep on uh, to keep on exploring this topic because it, you know you could there's layers upon layers to this. This is this is a question on everyone's mind. So thanks again, and I hope you have the great rest of your week.